Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped, and it's another one of those. I've got a big smile on my face because I'm speaking to someone from the past, but I've watched his journey from afar. I've spoken to him every now and then, but he is a storyteller, he's a coach, and he has gone way, way, way far away from these shores to go and make his way in the world. And <laughs> Is he making his way in the world? I absolutely love his enthusiasm. I love his outlook. And way back in 2016, I think it was, he did an article for me on the website. He typed up his answers and he sent them to me. We published it and away we went. But now, with the beauty of the pod, we can see him and hear him. So from Canada, the rodeo, the kilted cowboy, the one and the only Mr. Graham Moffat. Hello, sir. Hi, H.E. How you doing? Yeah, very well. I am absolutely buzzing to see you. Now, the kilted cowboy, forget rugby, where does the kilted cowboy come from? <laughs> yeah, it's a midlife crisis, I think, Bruce. I've always, uh, you know, always say you're shaped by your environment. So I live in Alberta and it's uh, it's pretty um, Western. And so uh, I've been excited about doing some rodeo stuff. And so I had a crack last year at some steer wrestling. That was pretty scary. Fun, though. And then uh, I tried to ride a holster, unfortunately, I broke my hand. And then just last week, uh, I won a belt buckle at the Rimby Rodeo as uh, doing the, we became the wild cow milking champions. So there you are. <laughs> the wild cow milking champions. Yeah I, yeah, I can't even begin to figure what that is. Yeah, I didn't really know until about five minutes before either, but it was good. <laughs> and, you, and you won a belt buckle and you sent me a picture of it on WhatsApp. You were pretty proud of that belt buckle. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. Small town rodeo, it was class. There's uh, some of the, you know, uh, Courtney Holcamp that plays for Canada. So I was her dad's partner. And he's won it, I think, the last seven out of ten times. But he needed a new partner. So I was, I volunteered for it. And then I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then I uh, and then I had a look at a video and seen what it was. And I got a bit scared. But I, I'm here to tell the tale. So it's good. <laughs> so, hang on. Let's rewind the tape. What happened to his old partner? <laughs> <laughs> he got stood on. <laughs> we got stood on. I actually met him 30 minutes before, or sorry, about 30 seconds before I went in the arena. And he says, Oh, thanks for doing it. After last year, you know, I just I couldn't, couldn't do it. And I was like, And I watched the video of him getting his head trampled on. And I'm like, Oh, man, what am I doing? But, so, so you go to Canada to do rugby and you end up wrestling with wild cows. Yeah, basically. It's fun. It's, enjoy- oh. it's enjoyable. I just think it's such a cool way of life, and they're just like such great, honest, like down to earth people, and it's just class being around them. I really enjoy it. If I had my way, I'm trying to encourage my wife to for us to buy an acreage so I can have some horses, but she's she's not she's not having it yet. So I got a bit of, I got a bit more work to go. Some some people find lycra and buy expensive road bikes. Some people get a motorbike. Some people get up to mischief. But you've decided that I want horses and cattle. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I don't want a sports car. I just want a, just want a horse. <laughs> You've become very wholesome since you went to Canada. Uh, it's fun. It's fun. It's not. It's random living in the city because I think our neighbours think we're mental. My son's always out with his rope lassoing, trying to <laughs> try to do stuff. My daughter's awesome in it. Actually, she was. She's pretty good. She's better than all of us. So yeah, it's. A, I don't know how we've ended up doing it, but it's been class. You, you must get pelters when you come home for the funny accent you've got now. It's, uh, you can't win. <laughs> I, I talk to people at home and they give me a hard time for my accent. And then, I, then after I've spoken to people from, from Scotland and then come back here, I got a hard time for talking funny again. So it's a, it's a no-win situation. You, you must have, when you first arrived, you must have had to repeat yourself a lot. Yeah, I used to be quite high energy when I would coach, so I'd, I'd get excited and I'd probably mumble a whole lot and probably not make any sense and there'd be loads of energy but there probably wasn't any comprehension as to anything I would anything I'd be saying so learn to calm down a bit. Was there any little Scottish mannerisms or sayings that you had that raised an eyebrow? Yeah, the best ones when my daughter said, "Oh, Dad, that's minging," and my my wife going, "What the hell did she just say?" <laughs> Class, I love it. Right, so you're an Edinburgh boy. How on? How did you end up in Canada? Like, how does that come around? 
yeah, totally random. Uh, 2005, I uh, ended up in a place called Red Deer, which uh, I had no idea what it was. It was in the middle of Alberta. Um, I took a player coach job for six months. Uh, when I was working for Curry Rugby Club, I actually took a sort of six month sabbatical. It was uh, it was an unreal experience. I loved it. Spent every day, kind of, you know, I'd go to the gym in the morning, I'd go to the lake in the afternoon, I'd coach in the evenings, and I just absolutely loved the lifestyle. And so there was a full time job came up in 2010. So I came over here, coached a club team for three seasons, and then just kind of kicked on from there. And I've been here for yeah, it's about 12 and a half years now. It's gone pretty quickly. You're you're one of those guys that I think probably always knew you were going to be a coach is that right yeah I think uh yeah uh, definitely something I always wanted to do you know and that would be you know, look at the coaches I had at Curry you know you probably didn't realize how good they were like Greco you know he used to I used to probably drive him nuts he used to drive me nuts um but you know he was he was class you know Ali Donaldson's done some amazing stuff you know still back uh back helping Cairnsy now you know which is which is good and so yeah I just had some a good exposure so I remember Years ago, I think when you're in grade four and fourth fourth year at high school, you go and do a rugby placement. Uh, so yeah, a school placement. I remember going to Edinburgh when Bob Eason was coaching, uh, like Wardy and Alan uh, Alan Watt were playing for Edinburgh and stuff at the time, and that was just it's kind of hooked me in, I guess. So I just loved it. So yeah, I've been I've been coaching nearly full well, not full time. Had a, a different years, but yeah, it's been it's been cool to spend most of my professional life, if that's even a thing, in, in sports. I read or I saw something, it was Eddie Jones said that if you ask professional players for a coach that had the biggest impact on them, a lot of them would say it's a junior coach or someone from when you were a kid. Who do you look back on now? You've mentioned a couple and absolute Scottish legends, Greco and Ali Donaldson. I mean, two guys who coach so many people and probably inspired guys like yourself to become coaches. Who do you look back on and go, that that was the point of ignition, maybe that was the point that, that got me? Yeah, so my old man was my coach when I was younger. And I think he just enjoyed being around the rugby club with his mates and having a beer. But he coached us for a long time. Um, I think the, problem, the person that's probably made, probably given me the biggest, not, he didn't he actually, never actually coached me, but it was Rob Moffat. Like he's been, uh, he's been class. Like I remember being pretty young coach and going in Edinburgh almost every day. When I worked at Telford College, my boss would basically load up my timetable Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, so I could spend some time uh, with him on a Wednesday, which was which was class. He, actually, Rob's just been in Canada this week. He's had uh, Melrose have been over on tour. He called me on uh, he called me on Saturday morning and didn't realise the time difference. It was like six o'clock in the morning. I had no idea what was what was happening. Yeah, yeah he's an excuse for him to get to Canada on tour. He's been trying to get Melrose there for years. I think he loves that place. It's like his second home. Yeah, he's uh, he's done a good job. It looks like the boys have had some fun and they've, they've, they've played some rugby and they've probably had a, a beverage or two, I'm guessing, along the way. Yeah, one or two. I, I heard mixed reports. There was some people saying there wasn't enough rugby to call it a rugby tour, and there was others saying there was too much rugby. It was getting in the way of the tour. So <laughs> each to their own, I suppose. <laughs> Totally, but yeah, that Rob was awesome. He was just like really, just really, really good. And I think the coolest thing was years later, getting to when he was coaching Romania and I was coaching Canada. It was uh, him and Lynn Howells. I remember Lynn when he coached in Edinburgh, coached Edinburgh. And it was just an absolute riot, just to you know, just to see them and have a catch up and you know, go for a go for a pint on a Thursday night before the game with them. It was a good laugh. So it's been really good. And yeah, he's just been a really good guy to talk to. So, so Rob Moffat. Uh, you know, as you probably know, uh, inspired me, my PE teacher, you know, still see him and speak to him and cop abuse from him as he does to everybody. What what was it you looked up at him and thought, that's it, that's the thing? Yeah, I think uh, he just had tons of energy. And then I think the main thing was that he just took time. Like I remember being in that, the little, uh, what do you call the port cabins outside the back of Murrayfield, sitting in there, scribbling stuff on the whiteboard. You know, like this is what I was thinking and stuff that he was doing, and yeah, I just I just really appreciate the time that he kind of you know, that kind of gave me. Like Bob Eason was really good as well when I was coaching at Stu Mel. Don't know what they were doing, giving me a job at my age. I was like twenty five or something like that. But it was, uh, yeah, he was really good too. You know, and so guys that never really never told you what to do, but just you know, just ask questions and point you in the right direction, and and uh, yeah, basically just having a thinking partner. So they they guys were both very good. Scottish rugby is a village. Canada is a massive place but i'd imagine 
the rugby community is is probably quite small. You, you won't bump into them, I suppose, in the way that you're able to, in the way you've explained. How much are you behaving like Rob Moffat did to you, Ali Donaldson did to you, Greco, Bobbyson? Are you able to do that to younger coaches? Yeah, I think there's, um, we, we got quite a bit, like, obviously COVID wasn't the, the best of time, but it allowed us to create community. And I think we got really um, a crowd of coaches together. We would meet almost uh, with the coffee club, we'd meet every Friday morning, we'd have uh, different coaches would come on and speak to us. And there'd be some experienced coaches, there'd be some young, some novice coaches, there'd be some good debate. Um, you know, it was uh, absolutely, uh, it was absolutely outstanding, just the coaches that we got access to. And then even now, it's just continued now, you know, informally. So there's been a lot of informal learning. There's been a lot of chat. There's WhatsApp groups going. There's information getting shared. Mate of mine, Aaron Tackle's doing his, uh, he's doing his master's in coaching at the moment. I feel like I'm doing mine because I'm reading all the academic journals and, you know, you're trying to trying to make sense of what you're doing. So it was, uh, it was good. It's been, uh, it's been awesome just to, just to have that and just talk about rugby, talk about coaching and, and you think you know a lot and then you scratch the surface and realize you know hee haw and you just gotta keep gotta keep learning and trying to grow. So I think I was the youngest coach in the Scottish mm. Premiership at the time and then you came in to Stu Mel and I remember us being at Greg Rutherford's wedding uh and, and having a beer or two and talking about it without me realizing that you had to be at pre-season training in about six hours time <laughs> uh on the Saturday morning. And I I loved that. I loved having that opportunity to at the time like you say you thought you knew everything i've been coached i've spoken to them i've read that i've watched that right now it's my time do you look back on that and go that's where i learned that and i'm never going to do that again or uh, i got that right bang on was there a lot of i suppose learning in that first gig yeah i think you like you, you learn um you learn you learn all the time don't you and you make a lot of mistakes and you're probably a bit ignorant to be honest in, in in your younger days when you're you know when you when you're coaching um i think the I think the thing that really captured me i had a two seasons coaching at forrester rugby club my brother came with me simon may doogie dingwall like real good lads and i put the fun into rugby again absolutely loved it like two years it was class can't say no to billy smith he just like pulls you in ever then but that was like so much fun just absolutely loved it kind of fueled my tank a bit again and then obviously Stu mel was good uh, first season of coach with ben gisson so that was uh, that was it was funny. He was a he was a real handful. He's uh, he was good. He, he was certainly no prisoners taken. I guess uh, he was good. And then obviously the year after was with uh, with, with Ned with Andrew Kelly. So it was uh, it was it was two good seasons. I enjoyed it. First year we had a bit of success and it was good fun. Second year not so much. We took a bit of a pace and and then I uh, put my tail between my legs and headed to Canada. So. <laughs> I don't know if you put your tail to your legs. Another another opportunity arose, I think, is probably what you would have said. So you go you go to Canada with kit bag under your arm. What was the intention? Just see what happens? Yeah, so my boss at Telford College, uh, Jackie Tully Jackson, she was awesome. And she gave me a two-year sabbatical. So a two-year sabbatical to, to head off. And so that kind of gave me a bit of security, knowing that I could come back and have a job if things didn't work out. And, year down the line I was enjoying it 18 months down it was good I tried to extend my sabbatical for a little bit longer and then um yeah and, and then just just stayed but I'm just having the ability to coach full-time you know as you said uh you were talking earlier it's not professional but it was like you know it, was, it allowed me to be full-time in terms of planning and preparing and coaching and uh just having the time on task and just a bit more mental bandwidth to prepare was really good so I really really enjoyed it and so I coached the Calgary Hornets for three years which was good fun Coach the the Wolfpack, the Prairie Wolfpack, which was my still my favourite team in the world. Like it's just a class bunch of guys, like so much fun. And then uh, yeah, and then also just some kind of stuff after that. But so loads you, of mistakes along the way. When when you arrive in Canada, <laughs> I, I played in upstate New York, and at the time I was only twenty, and I was playing with guys that were maybe ten years older, but actually they'd only been involved in rugby for a season, so they were you know their knowledge and experience was beginner level what did you find when you got to canada were you surprised was it a mixed bag was it were they better than you thought they were going to be yeah i think so i've been at stu mel like on the like the tuesday and then the following tuesday i rock up at beaver brook high school at Croach, and there's a sea can with some equipment in it some half inflated balls and like a, a really really bad 
pitch and I'm like, gee, this is, you know, this is a, this is a bit different, <laughs> you know, um, that was fun. But yeah, we had, a, we had a total mixed bag. You've got guys that are like, you know, come out for, to try rugby like late on. We had, um, we had some really good players like a uh, guy, James Buchanan, who played Canada Sevens, Nick Levins, we went on to be um, like Alberta's highest cap international. So we had good guys like that in our team. We had a few imports came in. Andrew Rose came and played with us. Nick Fraser came and played with us. Um, we also had a couple of guys from Jersey, Donald Sangster, guy Jimmy Norris that played Wales Seven. So we had like some, we had some pretty good players. But yeah, I had some, some a wide range of uh, you know of of, uh, of of abilities. And I used to always laugh. Nick Blevins, who was you know one of our best players by a mile, always ended up with your partnering in a drill with your third fifteen enthusiastic guy who's you know been in rugby for ten minutes. You know, so I don't know how we did it, but it was it was it was class. It was fun. So you. Like in my head, Scottish Scottish rugby small biggest trip is a few hours on a bus and you're back. How how did you bond that team together? Is it easy when you've got to travel so far for games? Yeah, it's a different it's a different beast. I remember we had a game in Edmonton and it was like three hours each way on the bus. Or well, it was meant to be three hours. And I saw so we're we getting a bus or we're going up Friday night, you know. And they're like, nah, nah, nah. We'll leave Saturday morning in cars. We'll meet at this. We'll meet at this gas station. We'll drive up. We'll play and we'll drive back at night. And I'm like six hours in the car for a game of you know for a game of rugby in one day. But yeah, the travels the travels wild. I think my my daily commute to work's 200 kilometers each way at the moment. My uh, my Nissan Pathfinder 2008 is sitting at 460,000 kilometers <laughs> on the clock. <laughs> it's uh, nursing it along, trying to get it to 500. Uh, so. So the boys are not in a bus sharing what they're sharing and going to the clubhouse. Are, are a lot of the club games, do they miss a home? Do they have a clubhouse? Yeah, so in Calgary, there's the Calgary Rugby Union. And so there's like five fields there and all the clubs share the one facility. So it's pretty good. You know, we take our kids down in the morning. My son plays U7s and then my daughter plays U9s. And it's, you know, typical, like probably what it's like in New Zealand for the minis playing. It runs through all day. And then you'll get your senior men's, senior women's game at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's pretty uh it's a pretty good community around it. And it's good now this that you know guys that I played with a bit here or guys I coached with, our kids are back playing. So there's like this huge generational U turn. You know, we're out on a Saturday morning with the you know with the U sevens or the U nines and it's uh, it's fun. So yeah. is that is that meaning the future's bright for Canada? Yeah, I think there's some work to be done here. That's uh you know we'd be we'd be lying if we said there wasn't. But uh yeah it's fun just seeing some just seeing the kids. There's a lot of kids play. Um, it is quite it's quite popular, but it's uh, it's just probably keeping them in the game and developing them is probably the biggest challenge we've got here. So some of it will be getting them to understand and know what rugby is. Is the Olympics help that? Is Simmons helping that? Yeah, I think there's been a bit of interest, obviously, just on the on the Commonwealth Games in the weekend as well. You know, it's a lot more people, a lot more access to it. I think it's like uh, rugby was never on the TV here, you know, but obviously with the Toronto Arrows now in the MLR, there's uh, games on TSN which is good, so there's getting a bit more exposure. There's starting to be a bit more chat about it. Um, it's like everything, you know, if a team's successful, there's a bit more interest, you know, and I think we had that in, uh, you know, with the Sevens at the Olympics, you know, uh, not, not this last one, but the one before. And so uh, I think there has been a bit more exposure to it. Uh, but it's always going to be, you know, unfortunately at the moment, a, a second or third tier sport. You know, it's a baby sport compared to, to hockey, to football, you know, and it just uh, it is what it is for the time being. Are there athletes moving from those sports, gridiron, hockey, basketball, and thinking, okay, there's an opportunity here in rugby? Yeah, actually, there's a, in, in the local league at the moment, there's a guy who's just finished playing in the in the Canadian Football League. You know, he's, he's a kind of locker six. He's a, he's a big he's a big fella. He's uh, you know pretty big and athletic, but just learned the game. But he's only like 23, 24, just been, you know, finished his, his professional football career. Uh, obviously just been released. So there's there's some there's some athletes for sure. There's some there's some specimens. There's some big some big bodies kicking around. And so even in the women's game too, there's a lot of really good athletes. We had a couple of uh, but a couple of players come over from soccer to play in our seventh season this year, which was really good. So just uh, it's it's still it's still obviously in its young years. There's a lot of a lot of development to, to happen. Uh, when I spoke to Richie Gray, he was on about being a development officer in Aberdeen and he went into the clothes shop High and Mighty and said to them, anybody that comes in here that's six foot four and looks like they're athletic, give them my number, I want them to come and play rugby. Have you tapped a few Mounties or Lumberjacks on the shoulder and said, boys, you fancy having a crack at this? Oh, without a doubt. 
I spend half my days walking up and down the university halls right now just looking for aspects. <laughs> What's What's your story? <laughs> what's your background? Are you sure you want to do this this sport? <laughs> it's another sport for you. I was getting a bad reputation in our department for trying to get athletes to come and play. Like leave leave them alone. <laughs> let, let them find their way. So you you go from that as being a full time coach, getting some time working with players. You know, not really at professional timings, but you were able to apply professional principles I suppose and put time and effort into it you then get you start to get involved in more I don't know serious programs demanding programs what did that require from you as a coach did the skills change at all or was it just more pressure yeah I think I probably got a bit lost to be honest Bruce I probably wasn't as authentic you know I think when I was coaching my, my club teams and provincial teams I was I was quite happy being me I was quite lively I was having a laugh, but, you know, where and I probably, once I kind of started doing some of the kind of stuff, I probably lost my way a bit, you know, I probably wasn't authentic, I probably didn't coach or act how I probably, well, which would be, you know, authentic to me, I probably conformed a bit more to how I felt I should be in that environment, so that was probably a big, a big mistake, um, you know, that, that I made. Another thing too as well, a hard bit here is obviously having a, you know, wife and two young kids and you know, go on the road for, you know, six weeks and then once you've done that tour, come back, you're pretty tired. And then you're straight into uh you're straight back to your day job on the on the on the Monday morning after getting back on the Sunday night. That was pretty that was pretty taxing. So I was working as a as like CEO of Rugby Alberta. Um, so I was trying to do that job, take a bit of unpaid leave, go on the road, coach, but still having to do work. And yeah, just was I was definitely nowhere near at my best. So it was pretty uh, pretty demanding. So when you, when I see this and I, I was chatting to somebody about this. Being a CEO, like, what did that mean? Because to me, you're moff, you're whistle, that picture, pushing the buggy with a bag of ball, you know, energizing people, learning, helping people to learn. And then you get a gig like that. That's a that's a different hat to wear, quite literally. Yeah, it was. I enjoyed some of it. I had a pretty good boss. Like, the guy, Sean Hofstetter, who was president, was really good. I learned a ton from him. He was actually the charge of the, of the club I was at in 2010 and then we kind of both moved up and he was with a he was president of the provincial union so he was really good learned a lot from <clears throat> learned a lot from him but yeah I enjoyed the strategic planning side of it I enjoyed trying to write programs develop programs you know uh, that was really enjoyable but um you know when you've got 5,000 members and you've got like four four sub unions um they always say that crap doesn't roll downhill; it goes uphill pretty quickly. <laughs> and so it's uh, you'd be you'd be like, okay, I wonder who I'm having an argument with today, you know. And it was it was draining, to be fair. Um, you know, some of it was good. I was kind of a dual role, so I was like director of rugby slash CEO, which I don't even know what that. Like you said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's a great question, but it seemed to be the guy you had to call if there was stuff that had to happen or whatever. So, yeah, so you must have you must have become a bit of a political animal. No, I'm definitely not. I don't think I'm smart enough for that person. <laughs> <laughs> but you had some real success you you increased player numbers you put in new programs new competitions you must look back with i know you probably looking back thinking geez that was tough and but you must look back with a fair amount of pride on some of the achievements yeah it was cool we got i think we got like provi a provincial union of the year like uh two years in that or twice in that kind of five-year spell we hosted uh, hosted a lot of internationals here. You know the women's the senior national women's team. Uh, obviously, Canada played Scotland in uh, in Glasgow. Sorry, in um, in Edmonton, and then obviously we had the seven series here last year too. So there was a bit of um, yeah, it was good. They had some good stuff. But the coolest thing is just seeing some of the players you know come through. I think at the Commonwealth Games team at the weekend, I think there was four or five Alberta girls in that squad of twelve or thirteen, which was cool. And they're young too. They're like 18, 19, 20 years old and ripping it up uh, young Piper Logan she was uh, she made the dream team in her first you know in her first event so seen seen like players like that come through that's that's pretty cool so you were still able to be on the field yeah I think that's why it was so hard because I was trying to work and then trying to be do a bit of coaching too so my wife coached uh, my wife played for Canada sevens and fifteens and so I'd always end up roping her and doing some coaching so she would always coach with the you know the girls provincial team and then I always be kind of kicking around to try to help her out a bit so so it was uh yeah it was a lot there was a lot on the go Where the many when, when we did the interview in 2016 
uh, I think uh, one of the questions I asked you was the best bit of advice you'd been given. What, what I'll, I'm going to see if you can. Re- you don't have to remember what it was, but what what's the best bit of advice you've been given? What's the best bit of advice I've been given? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know what. What's the best bit of advice I've been given? I get so much of it on a daily basis. <laughs> what was that, the answer? Well, <laughs> that's that's just I, I did have it here, and I've now bloody lost it because that was one of the things that I really I really liked, and probably sums up that you did things not necessarily early, but you know, becoming head coach at Stu Mel at twenty five, moving to Canada, taking on those roles. And then when I looked back at this, what is the best bit of advice you've ever received? And you said, if not now, when? Success mm. lies in your daily habits. Be consistent and persistent. Is that still you? Yeah, I think if not now, when, for sure. Um, you'd probably argue I was a bit, I might be a bit impulsive. <laughs> you know, let's just, go and, let's just go and try stuff. And I think um, I remember being down in Santa Monica at a Tier 2 head coaches meeting. And we didn't have a head coach for Canada, so I went along. And uh, and Eddie Jones was doing was presenting, and he's always just talking about say, why are you trying to do what a tier tier one country does? Because you don't have the same quality of players. Like you almost like you have to be innovative and you have to try things. And I think it's easy now, you know, in rugby to everybody's like one three three one, and we'll do the same stuff, and everybody's looks the same, smells the same, and it's kind of boring, you know. And and so I think just having the courage to go and try something different and realize that it might not work. But you know, everything always starts by somebody trying to do something a little bit, a little bit different. So that's my goal for this year. I've been uh, picking Kieran Crowley's brain. He's been unfortunately bombarded with some of my stuff, trying to pick it apart and see what I'm going to do if it's going to work or not. So, but I think yeah, I think probably yeah, and then just doing stuff on a daily basis for sure. I probably went through a bad spell, Bruce, when I was working in rugby Alberta, where I wasn't particularly healthy. My office was maybe 15 minutes from my bed. <laughs> I would be rolling out of bed straight into the office. You know, you probably wouldn't shower change. You'd be lunchtime before you've done anything, you know. And, uh, you know, probably wasn't, in a, probably wasn't in a great place. But now, you know, I've got I've got my routines. I've got to get up in the morning. I've got to do my push-ups as many as I can. So I'm up to about seven now. So I do my push-ups in the morning. <clears throat> and then That's I- six <laughs> more than me. <laughs> And then I've got to then I've got to uh, I've got to have some water before I'm allowed a coffee, and then I'll go take the dogs for a walk. You know, I just 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 better lifestyle habits, I think, as much as anything. You know, and if I, if I move in the morning and I'm feeling better, I typically function better and coach a bit better, and be a bit more patient with my kids. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, that's probably it. But I do think it's important because if you get good habits and good routine, it makes a huge difference. Huh? So uh, James Clear's books, Atomic Habits, it's awesome, really really good book definitely something I was able to read and apply a lot from. So was was there a moment where you thought, hang on a minute, it, it's that sort of mm-hmm. pouring from an empty cup? Did there Was there a moment where you thought, hang on, mm-hmm. where, where's Moff gone? Totally, 100%. Yeah, I would say as well, just changing jobs just over just over a year ago is really kind of, I'm able to probably find my feet again and really kind of be who I am. They think I'm mental, but I, don't, I think it's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might be onto something. Uh, one of the other things you said, uh, I, I don't know if you'll remember this, I asked you what your ambitions were for the future. Nope, you said two things. Okay. You, you said be a great coach and a great family man. Yeah, that's uh, that's good, yeah. I think I think everything that's like, I think you've got to be consistent in terms of like being the same person in every room. And I think often we're wearing different masks and different settings and different people. Where I think now I'm probably happy being the same, wear the same mask in all in all environments. You know, I think uh, that's probably I think's probably pretty key. So, like when we, uh, if I'm coaching now, Bruce, my my wife's often around, the kids are on the bus. My son thinks it's normal to just start singing karaoke on the front of the rugby bus. Just comes up, grabs the microphone, and starts singing. You know, he's six years old. Just thinks it's normal life. So if we've got any team events, I just take the kids and always kind of joke is like, well, if I'm coming to work here, then you know, just get me or we'll get the entourage as well. And so my wife's been doing a bit, a bit of strength and conditioning coaching, some speed sessions with our team, and the kids are kicking around doing stuff. So I think it's uh, you got to try. I think you got to bring everything together. It takes a bit of time though, doesn't it? You're some of the things you're saying are absolutely hit home with me. It takes a bit of time until you're maybe comfortable in your own skin. 
yeah, big time, absolutely. And I think uh, I don't know for whatever reason if it's that we're just so we get so focused on the outcome. I've got to be coaching at this level next. I've got to be doing this and I've got to be doing that. I've co- I've got a job coaching job right now, which I never ever dreamt or thought of that I would have. You know, I'm a full time coach at a university, coaching a a woman a women's university rugby team, and a part of my role is also to be like uh, a head of uh, high performance coaching. I'm still trying to figure out what the second part is, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just supporting coaches to try and get you know to get better and, and learn and basically just try and create a culture of community within the, within the department so going re- rewinding right back little moth mm. teenager moth the, the, the more i do these pods and the more the people i speak to nobody can have predicted where they've ended up there's very few people have gone on that ladder to success you know they've they got into that team, that team, that team, and and also they're not very interesting people to speak to either. But you've you've gone and and found this thing, and you'll be too humble to say it, but you're making a success of of life, I would say. Um, teenager Moff, what what was he looking at? What was he trying to come up with? What was his idea of success? What was teenager Moff looking at? Um, keep my hair. That would, been, that would have been. Yeah, I saw that iceberg. Uh, yeah, but, but I think we always laugh at my brother because my dad's bald as can be, so am I, and my brother's got a full head of grey hair. <laughs> Bizarre. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I think I think I always kind of envisioned something being in sport for sure. Um, like I never thought I'd still be in Canada after you know one, you know after a six months stint way back in two thousand and five. I think for me, I'd probably you know I, I went to, I went to uni, but I was probably a pretty bad student. To be honest, I wasn't very good. I think I scraped through my sports science degree at Napier. I went back and did education through Aberdeen University years later, and I did a bit better because I was a bit more mature and you know had a bit more of an interest in it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. To be honest, they always say that the uh, you know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and so like my old man coached a bit of rugby. I was coaching a bit of rugby. He was bald. I was balding. He was he was like an egg shape. I was developing that shape too. And uh, you know he was he was teaching post secondary education, and so was I. <laughs> you know, so I remember driving home one night, but yeah, I'm literally turning into my old man. So yeah, oh, tell me about that one. I am Anakin Skywalker. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah, it's um, I, I love that. So the the apple's fallen pretty far from the tree, but in lots of ways, there's a lot of similarities. And now you find yourself in a job that teenager moth didn't even know existed and didn't exist when you were teenager moth so the game's changed and there's a lot of people have changed within it the the day-to-day job what does that look like for you yeah day to day, so I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the day-to-day job so we um, literally run it as a full-time program we've got um we've got scholar academic scholarships that we can we can give to players um we start training camp on august 15th and that'll run till the 27th but yeah typically we uh we have a pretty good week, so Monday we'll, you know, probably periodize our week like most people do. We'll we'll do some, uh, you know, some, you know, um, some clarity and correction on a Monday, and we'll we'll we, we'll be in the gym and we'll do some, uh, you know, we'll do some, we call it PGM Monday, so Personal Growth Monday, where we'll do a lot of a lot of individual skill work. Uh, Tuesday's a big day for us. We do unit skills at six thirty a.m. in the morning. Uh, we'll be in the gym in the afternoon, and then we're we'll back on field from four thirty to six. Um, that's our kind of big day. So transition Tuesday, and that's where we do most of our combat stuff. Uh, Wednesday we're off, so I say off. The, the the team will do yoga, and they'll have some, um, and they'll have study hall, where they'll do their do their study and make sure that they're staying on top of their academics. Uh, Thursday we'll do rugby and gym again, and that's kind of trying to be more of an attack day for us. And then Friday's Fab Friday, and so Fab Friday is either we uh, either we're on the road traveling for a game, or we might have a captain run if we're at home. And so, uh, and then obviously we'll play on the weekend. And so that's kind of what a typical, what kind of typical week would look like. And then uh, in between that, I'll go and watch other coaches. It's fascinating learning about basketball, soccer, swimming, track and field. Um, our track and field coach is like Rain Man when it comes to periodization. So I've learned a ton from him. It's been really good. I think even though I'm su- meant to support him, it turns into a personal mentoring session for me every time I chat with him. So... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's been fascinating to be honest. Just going around other sports and just ask questions. You know, like well, why do you do that? You know, this just doesn't make sense. So that's been pretty cool. And obviously, uh, Russell Earnshaw, you know, Rusty and Fletch, we spent a fair bit of time chatting with. They've 
you know, they've really like Rusty challenges me all the time. I'm like, well, what do you think of this? He's like, well, why is it five pages? Make it one. And you're like, oh man. <laughs> and so he's been he's been really good. And so we just been able to kind of you know copy some of the stuff that you know they bring to the table and what they've been doing and. And it's, and it's working in terms of the engagement with the coaches and challenge them on more on their how to coach. I don't know basketball. I can't tell you how to coach basketball, you know, but maybe around some of your coaching behaviours and your session plan design. So I think right now, you know, without being big headed, I'm probably doing my best work I've ever done at the moment um, in terms of like the planning for stuff, the having time to invest and prepare properly. So I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying it. I don't think it's big head at all, mate. I think it's it's honesty, and and you deserve that honesty. So, you said something about when you were a student, and this makes me laugh because it's very similar to me. I don't think I was a very good student either, as my degree will will prove. And now I love learning, and I talk about learning all the time. And I'm speaking to you, and I'm learning, and you know, I'm reading a book just now, and it's 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 learning. I, I gave my my wife the book i've just finished and she i said to her are you enjoying it she went yeah but it's a bit like work because it's about leadership and so it's kind of wasted on the youth do you get do you get to that point with your players where you t- you don't know how bloody lucky you are or h- how do you how do you communicate that to the players yeah i think it's uh there's as you say learning i think to, i heard a brilliant quote and i'll, I'll claim it as mine because i heard it a while ago so i can probably say it now <laughs> But, you know, it used to be like learning was the prerequisite for a job where now learning is the job, you know, and I think like everything's changing so much, you know, all the time. Like I'd, I'd hate to think back to look at even sessions like three, four years ago or how I interacted or how I led or what I did. So I think, like, yeah, there's so much to learn, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, you, you just don't know what it, you just don't know, <laughs> you know, where do you begin? You know, I, I love reading about leadership. Uh, I'm in the car a lot. <laughs> so I've always got a, an audio book or podcasts in. You know, so it gives me plenty of time to, to listen to stuff and learn. And, yeah, you know, when you put it in perspective, like a lot of the players I'm working with at the moment, they're, they're basically getting paid, you know. But, yeah, they're on, there's a lot of scholarships, but they're getting some, you know, reasonable money to, to be a part of our varsity program and train. And, uh, you know, and they're lucky. I don't really see that happening, you know, a whole lot in other places, particularly in the place where I, I work is in Lethbridge. And actually, when I went to Lethbridge, one of the first nights out I had, um, I went to this local bar for some wings because it's what you do here on a Thursday night. And I met two guys and they're like, oh, you're Scottish. Do you know Duncan Wilson? Do you know Davy Wilson? Because <laughs> they'd, they'd been over and played for the, the club there about 100 years ago or whatever it was. So it's such a small world, like you said, the rugby community. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people could ask that question. Do you know Duncan Wilson? Uh, depending on who you are, you might change your change your answer so you're you're learning on the job you're helping other coaches do you find that now coaches are willing to be challenged do you think there's a change i feel there's a bit of change in the culture of coaches the the closed doors you're not going to see what i'm doing because it's a big secret seem to have gone are you are you enjoying that is that something that's evident in your program yeah, I'm loving it. Uh, it's really good. I think uh, you know, you're talking about like not, not knowing a lot. I was just talking about the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, where you're full of confidence and your confidence is high, but your competence is like low. You know, and you just make a real mess and you get all after it and you're like, well, you know, you're the peak amount stupid and then before you know, you're in the valley of despair and then you're like, start trying to figure stuff out on that slope of enlightenment, you know, like, oh, maybe I, maybe there's, I should do this or I should do that. But I think, I think it is good. It's like everyone else. Most of it starts with trust. You know, if they don't trust me, I'm sure when I came out of my job, they'd probably, well, what's this guy? Who's this guy? What's he all about? Like, what's he going to tell me about coaching? You know, and uh, and and hopefully that's not the case. I'm not there. To, I'm not there to get anybody. It's, I'm not. I'm not there to get anybody. It's. I'm just there to to do some. Um, you know, just to help them really and support them and maybe challenge them. That's uh, and a challenge. And I say challenge. It's just to maybe think about something a bit differently. You, have, you, have you had quite a few jobs where you've almost had a blank sheet? It sounds to me like you've been able to to put your own stamp on things. Yeah, just about every job I've had here has been a blank slate, you know, which has been class, you know, which has been really, really good. And so you get time to have a look at well, what's success everywhere else. But then how do you how do you just adopt a model? I see it, I've seen it in here quite a bit. You know, we have a Kiwi coach, so everyone's done the Kiwi way. We have a Welsh coach, everyone's done the Welsh way. Instead of actually saying, well, how can we take and learn from all these great what all the great work that's been done not just in, in rugby but in other sports and then what applies to our context 
because you can't just drop a model in and say, hey, here you go, this is this is going to change the game or, hey, this is going to change your organisation because everyone's context-specific. Is, so, the, is the Canadian culture something that can add to a rugby programme? Yeah, I, I think it can. You know, they're, they're incredibly nice people. I always get a hard time because they say sorry a lot. <laughs> But no, I think I think I think there is. I think there's so many good things about like this country. Some great things, um, and and definitely have the, the the bones, you know, the raw materials to to do some really good stuff. You know, probably lack a bit around the you know the, the education, the IQ side of it. The the weather has a big part of it, <laughs> you know. So I know we're um, you know like we're really relying now with this where we live in on having domes, you know, having full like permanent uh, dome structures so that we can continue to train and play kind of all year round. So we're starting to see a lot more like sevens tournaments in you know in December, January when it's minus thirty five out and you're you're freezing, but we still get the opportunity to play, which is good. I I love the the point you made. You can't just drop a program in. Is there a is there now a workforce of Canadian coaches who are coming through who have benefited from the experience of the Welsh model, the Kiwi model, the Scottish model, and now they're beginning to shape things in their own image? Yeah, I think, you know, probably, uh, you know, Corey Hector, who's with the Toronto Arrows, is an assistant coach. He's their academy coach. He's their, um, he's their academy coach. He's their, um, he's coaching Canada under 18s. He's coaching Canada under 20s. There's a lot of ex-players starting to come through now, like Phil Max coaching the academy. He was the defence coach for Canada in the last uh, series there. Uh, Hubert Biden's with prop. He's been out on some tours. as uh, He's with the 18s at the moment as a scrum coach, but he was scrum coach on one of the, the senior trips to Belgium. So there's, uh, there's more and more, you know, opportunities. And, I think we just you know, a lot of these coaches are, just need to continue to be nurtured and supported. You know, not not told what to do, but just supported so they can keep getting keep getting better and better. So are you finding cool. that there's that there's obviously pockets, there's little hotbeds around Canada rugby. Um, are you finding that those are now spreading, or is it still very much centralised in those big population areas? Yeah, I think it's. I think definitely. I think there was a a really good network created across all the provinces. Uh, there's 10 provinces in Canada and we're actually working we were starting to work really well together so we ran a coaching conference online which was which was awesome we had some some big hitters you know which was good Rusty and Fletch were on Amy Price was on a guy called Ross, Rob Mason an Australian guy who specializes in feedback you know he was class Rob Howley spoke there was just so many good coaches came on and you know and shared uh, Cody Wilde who's doing some cool stuff in coaching at the moment so there was some really really good um you know, some really good uh, coaches were on it. I think that was a really good starting point, but that hasn't continued on, unfortunately. But just the ability to learn from other coaches, create some community to interact with coaches from different regions, we all face the same challenges, you know. So if we've uh, if somebody's done something and they found a good way, well, let's uh, let's see if it can work for us too. So you're in this uni program, and I know that you know they've become the the buzzwords culture and environment. <laughs> what what is the culture and environment in your program? Yeah, we. Um, I, I think it's the most important thing. I probably spend way too much time trying to get the environment right. That's uh, that's probably where I spend the majority of my time. Because if the environment's not right, um, I, and I want people to have a great experience, and I think for me that's. Uh, I actually read something on on the, on the Instagram or the Facebook this morning or the Twitter. It was something they were talking about. Um, they were just talking about the the Scotland women's sevens at the Commonwealth Games. You know, just about trying to create the best possible environment for players, and, and that resonates with me because I think it, we do want to have positive experiences. You know, so that's probably where I'll spend a lot of the time. We'll do do some fun stuff. Um, I like my theme in as well, so we're just getting ready. I'm not sure when this will air, Bruce, but uh, you know, hopefully not before our training camp starts. We're going with a Top Gun theme this year, so we've. Uh, oh no! I've got a Top Gun theme for the season. I'll have to learn from you then, because we've got I've got dog tags made up. They've been delivered to the house. Well, we've got like a captain's face has been superimposed on the Tom Cruise's body, so we're like we've got a few things in the works. We've played we've got a volleyball tournament planned, so we can just blast Top Gun soundtrack out of our volleyball competition. So I, I think for me, like, that's the most important part: is create the best environment. And you know, players will come and go; it's inevitable. Not everybody's going to jive with everybody, but let's try and provide a, an unreal experience. And uh, you know, and, and hopefully that'll you know uh, transfer into some on-field success as well. So you're you're dealing with young people. Uh, you know, a uni program means you don't have that weathered, experienced 30, 35 year old who's going to tell you 
how the culture is and how so i suppose every year you're almost going to have a chance to reinvent things yeah 100 percent. last year we themed around the city because i didn't know a lot about the city a lot of the players didn't know a lot about the city and so we kind of themed a lot around that trying to connect them with uh, where they're going to school so that was uh, that was really good but yeah every year or every other year they'll be able to do something we've got a big uh we got a big turnover. Actually, the, the old coach is my new boss. He's now the athletic director. So he said he didn't leave a lot in the stable. So I've got a, I've got a bit of work to do recruiting. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've got about 12 players coming in this year. And then we'll probably need about another 12 next year, um, which is exciting. But we've got a, we just signed a 31-year-old, which is cool. And so we'll have a 17-year-old, 31-year-old. We'll have, um, yeah, we'll just have a load of different people from backgrounds. I was saying we're not really building a team this year. We're building a gang. We're going to build a gang. <laughs> The top gun gang. <laughs> yes. So how how do you create then that sense of belonging? You've got your staff, you've got these young people coming into a program in a city they don't know much about. It's got to happen quick. How do, how do you make things happen quickly? Yeah, it's a it's such a good challenge, isn't it? I think we've got a few things planned. Um, we, I don't know how they're going to go because it's stuff we've never really done before. But I think um, we've we've kind of scrapped the gym for the first week, so we're doing some. Yeah, after hey. chat, inspired by you, Bruce. <laughs> <in our> chat. <laughs> so we're uh, we've got like, we're doing a combat day. We're doing mixed martial arts one day. We're doing gymnastics another day. So we'll try and create good experiences. And then uh, and last year we went away to a ranch for three days as a team building exercise, which was also that's where I broke my hand trying to ride this thing out of a shoot. <laughs> but uh, you know, so we, we'll definitely do a lot of stuff off the field. Because uh, I think it's important that we can that we can bond and give people a safe place. Uh, Owen Eastwood's book "Belonging" is is yeah, class. I've really enjoyed. It. I've, I'm in the middle of that just now. I'm I'm absolutely loving it, and that that to me is so important. Uh, you, there has to be that emotional connection. I'd imagine your players have an emotional connection to you because the way you go about things and carry yourself. But sometimes it can be difficult to get an emotional connection to the shirt. How? Is is that what happens in battle? Yeah, I don't. I, I know, like you, that was obviously the chat. You know, you got to do it for the jersey and stuff like that, and you know, like to leave the jersey in a better place. I don't know if our players or this generation resonates with that. You know, they'll come in, they'll go to school, they'll get their education, they'll play. Uh, hopefully, have a great experience and have an affinity with the program. But uh, I, I kind of steered away from that as a kind of motivational thing. I don't, I don't really see it. It's like we've got to find what. You know, why that? Why they're playing? What's their reasons being? And it kind of connect. Like we we want to be the we said we want to be the best rugby program in North America, and we want it to have it through good education and quality experiences. So that has to drive everything that we everything that we do. And so getting the experiences right, we've got a we've got a couple of um couple of things planned. There's a in the in the grand town of Nanton. There's a there's like a a, a flight a, a flighter pilot museum or whatever so we'll be having a trip to there because we've got in our in our team we've got our bomb squad and we've got our flying squad so they'll go to the bo- the bomb squad will go to the bomber museum in this little town just about an hour north of us which will be fun and so we're just doing i know just trying to make you know, make it fun and try and get them to connect with their team but then connect with the vision that we've got for the program as well who when you're sitting in these planning meetings who says to you moff you need cam doing or Moff, no, we we can't do that. We we can't. We, there's no way we can pull that off. Yeah, I uh, a room next. My, my office is right next door to the women's basketball coach, and he thinks I'm a head case. But I have tons of fun with him. Dude, what do you think of this? And he's like, you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, but actually, really cool actually. So the staff that are like the manager and the coaches that are involved in the program, they've been there for 20 years, you know. And in this day and age, it's pretty unheard of that you'll have staff that have been there for so long so that kind of gave me a good indication when I took the job that there's probably someone pretty special here if after 20 years all these coaches are still involved in some capacity so that's been uh, that's been fun did I read it right the rugby program or the, the athletic program has been there for 22 years and the guy you replaced had been there for all but two of them is that right and he's moved upstairs that's right, yeah, and he's uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's actually so he's the athletic director now. Neil Langevin, his name is. So Neil coached the Canada women's team, uh, you know, a, a few years ago, and um, he's now the big boss. But he's my assistant coach with the team, so I would say if I get wind, he's going to fire me. I'm going to fire him first. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So it sounds like you're happy in the moment. You're you're in the place that. All your experience, all your learning has brought you to. 
it's it sounds like it's a pretty good place to be. Yeah, I mean, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, I, I think um, yeah, work at the university is great because there's that all the different sports is probably what I'm enjoying the most. Be able to interact on a daily basis, talk coaching, you know, bring speakers in, um, just for us to have that community. I think that part's been really, really good because you learn. Off, there's so many good coaches. All the coaches there have done some amazing things. Played a huge role in like development of some really good athletes, and so that part's been um, really enjoyable. And I think it's just a yeah, it's just a good feel. I'm enjoying it. It's kind of I've got me energized again, which I'm happy about. And yeah, although I don't want to be this crazy old guy that's you know energizer bunny bobbing around the department <laughs> in the mid forties. So we'll see. But no, it is, it is good. And so I think there's some good some good people. It's a good place to work, and uh, the community gets behind it too. Like we have a we had a thousand spectators at our first home game last year, you know, in a in a small city, you know, seven o'clock kickoff under the lights, and hopefully that'll just keep growing and growing and growing. That's so, cool. That's yeah. very cool. If you could bring somebody in, anybody, who would you bring in to speak to the coaches? The guy that I'm fascinated with at the moment is Rob Mason, and he's uh, he specialises in feedback. He's a good dude. I was. Uh, friend of mine was on went to have a meeting with him and I just crashed the party because I wanted to listen and then we text back and forth and you know he's uh, he's really good he's, he's really helped me I think it's quite important the, the role of feedback and then obviously he specializes in in-game coaching and then obviously feedback and video uh, I think he's been fascinating um, I think Doug Lamoff would be a would be a cool guy to bring in too obviously he's just had the, the book was it the coach's guide to teach him that kind of made that made my head hurt a bit when I was trying to process trying to process that so i think he would be a, a really cool one to speak to so yeah i think there's so many good people from different sports that i don't even know that would be amazing to bring them to speak to but they'd be two that would be quite high you know quite high on my list i think in terms of because uh we you know yeah they would be higher on my list i think have you started writing your own book uh, definitely not <laughs> when you said when you said i'd written something for you i said well hope you use grammarly to check it out because it <laughs> There would be some spell mistakes in there, and there wouldn't be much, much punctuation. <laughs> oh, so yeah. you, you're happy where you are, and I, I don't know if if the mind wanders. Is there a is there a plan? Um, no, no. <laughs> I think uh, no. I, I'm I'm happy with where I'm coaching at the moment. I definitely, I, I, you know, I definitely would want to get back into some, you know, some. Uh, I want to say higher level coaching, but some international coaching and stuff again, or. Um, you know, some 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 kind of pro stuff. I was quite interested in the MLR. I think that'd be quite a fun place to go, although the turnover in coaches is ridiculously high on an <laughs> annual basis. So uh, I guess it goes with the territory, but I think there's some, that'd be quite fun. I look at like, you know, some of the guy, Canadian guys at DTH and uh, Ben LaSize, which have had an absolute riot down at LA. Like, uh, it looks like there's been tons of fun. Um, I'm a wannabe cowboy, so maybe, maybe Texas is a good place for me. Maybe Austin or Dallas. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we've heard all about you. You're the kilted cowboy. In you come. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, who's gonna want to be? You can't go. <laughs> I have a I have a Stetson and a belt buckle. I'm yours. Exactly. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, I think just with the age of kids right now, you know, it's like important for them to have a little bit of stability. And so that's good. Um, that was quite a big conversation we had years ago. Like, are we just going to go on the road and just travel? You know, because not many full-time coaching gigs in Canada, so it's um, you know, you're gonna we're prepared to move around from place to place or set up boots here for the time being. So we'll never say never, and um, we'll see. I think part of me would love to go back to Scotland for a bit. I think that'd be cool, cool experience for the kids just to go and live, you know, go and live somewhere else and uh, and come home for a bit. I haven't been haven't been home since my stag do, which was just over five years ago. So <laughs> that's the last. Is that time. because you're not allowed back? <laughs> Maybe yeah. <laughs> Pictures yeah. up at the airport. Yeah. Passport <laughs> confiscated. So yeah, yeah, that would be the, that'd be the last time I was back. I think it was for the Heineken Cup final or the European Cup final. Um, so that'd be yeah. So it's been a while. So I would be I'd keep come come uh, come back for that. I think at some point. With with the belonging, um, a lot of it is about storytelling. And now I I. You know, we, we could talk for a long time and we could probably share stories and uh, have people in common in those stories and all sorts. What? How much do your players know about Graham Moffat and the journey he's been on? 
Yeah, so they, they all know the one story. Bruce, you might not remember, but I wasn't blessed with a speed gene. <laughs> oh, hey, I hear you, brother. <laughs> I remember playing at Melrose Simmons years and years and years ago. And uh, and they, always, they all laugh at their story. So I think like, in my mind, it probably looks far better. But I remember selling a dummy and then starting to run. And then all of a sudden, I hit this travelator on the field at the green yards. And I felt like I was running uphill in quicksand. And all I heard from the crowd was somebody shout, unhook the caravan. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the guy Graham Paris actually. If you remember Graham Paris, yeah, yeah, I know Graham. But I think, um, yeah, that was me, and I was like, so they've all heard that story. I'm like, if we talk about the importance of speed work and you know, and trying to train, but I think they've kind of got a good insight into us. Like, we've got a pretty much open door policy at the house. There's, if we're going on a road trip from Lethbridge to Edmonton, we'll stop at my house. We'll have breakfast. You know, we'll just the bus, the bus will just unload, and people will pile up my house, and we'll make some food for them. So they've got a pretty good. I think they got a pretty good idea, you know, around kind of who we are and kind of as a family. Because I think that's important. Like, I'd hate to have two lives where they're completely separate. So I think that's been probably the coolest thing. And my, my son's best friend is a girl called Sarah, who's 24. <laughs> he says they my kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's just uh, yeah, it's just cool. They just like it. They like being around. The, they like being around the teams. So it's fun. I remember being on a Canada tour. We played in Victoria, and uh, I my daughter with me. She, she, we just took out the pool, gave, gave my wife a break, and it's funny just seeing all these massive men, just like, you know, just like little kids, and quite giddy that there's like a baby kicking around in the pool. I don't think it's, I think that's part of it too, right? You have to, I just have to be yourself everywhere. I think. But it's taken me forty years to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it probably took me about the same. So you've got, you've got this job that's quite. Uh, local, sort of short boundaries. You know, it's a group of people in a in a small town uni program. But you've got this much wider world vision of what's going on. You're obviously passionate about the game and what it can do. You've still got a yearning for Scotland by the sounds of things, but Canada means a lot to you. Is there still a desire to make the rugby world a better place? Is there still a lot for Moff to give? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, if if anybody wants it, <laughs> some. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. I think absolutely there is. Like, I think it's good. Um, you know, it, there's, you know, we've had some unbelievable experiences and met some really great people along the way. And like, I, I just like think now, just I'm thinking back, just the people that I've had the chance to interact with and chat with. You know, it's pretty lucky. You know, in terms of the quality and the levels that they've worked at. And so I think there's, I do like coach education and. I enjoy it in a more informal way. I think a lot of the stuff that uh, Rusty's doing is class. I think it's really good. He's, uh, he's challenged me a lot around coaching and how to coach. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's, I think there's so much we can do as a coach that in the way that we behave and how it influences the environment. And I don't think we never, we don't think we really take that into consideration. I think we often plan for action, not necessarily interaction. I know I'm a lot more cognizant now in terms of how I coach, how I interact, uh, really clear on what the outcomes of the sessions that I'm running and still on this too, but is that we're trying to do a pre-mortem as opposed to a post-mortem. Like what, what could go wrong? Let's plan for you know, let's plan for that. So that's been really, really helpful. So oh, I love it. We're near we're near at the end, Moff, and your your kids and wife probably deserve some time with you before you disappear on your road trip. Um but I I do wonder can you go back or this moth, this sort of moth who's found his place in the world and is happy with life and happy with his job and has his routines and is feeling a bit happier with, with most things in life. You then get the chance to go and speak to the Curry under 18 squad or the kids on the rugby course at not Telford college, Edinburgh college. And what, what would your advice to them be looking back on the journey you've had? I think take every opportunity that you get. I think we, uh, I think we're often maybe a bit scared to step outside of our comfort zone. You know, go somewhere a bit different. I, I think I would, rec- I would totally recommend just to go and just go and have experiences. You know, go and have an overseas experience. You know, go somewhere else. Get out your comfort zone. You know, could have been, uh, could have been easy. I could probably could have stayed at Curry my whole life. You know, but go out and try something. Go, go somewhere else. And, and I think too, like Canada's, you know, like say second tier nation, 
but the experiences and the fun that you have is like is is ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous. I was laughing with Rob Moffat because they went to Montreal to play, but they didn't really have a game lined up because there'd been some mixed communication. But the team didn't want to play them on the Thursday, but they're happy to host them on the Thursday night in the pub. <laughs> so they had like, you know, <laughs> but, you know they can't play because they're on a playoff run taking it serious, but they'll take you at the pub and party with you all on a Thursday night and still play a game on a Saturday. I'm still trying to figure that out in my head. But I think, yeah, just the, the overseas experiences. Like I went to um, Vail with Andy Muir. Him and I played there for, I don't know what year it was, 2002 or something like that. It was so much fun just to, to go somewhere different. You know, I just look at the contacts everywhere. I talked to Snoopy a lot, who's in, you know, who's in, uh, you know, who's in Hong Kong. He's very good, uh, kind of coaching ally. There's just there's there's people all over the world that, you know, you can go and and see and have different experiences. And I think all them different experiences shape you. Otherwise, you only know one way of doing things. So, I think that'd be pretty. That would be my one piece of advice. I think that's a bit of a mic drop moment. I love that. That was class. You pretty much summed up what I keep harping on about on here, so I'm glad it's coming for somebody else. Moff, I've absolutely loved speaking to you. Now, I didn't tee up for this at all. This is the last question. Uh, we've had various different answers to this. I'm interested to hear what's going to come from you. Uh, so for you, Graham Moffat, happiness is? Finish the sentence for me. Excellent, No, no, no. Come on. you got to be more creative than that. I'm not well, letting you off for that. Well, I, thought that was like a, I thought that was a setup. I was like, I know the no, answer. No, 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 no. For you, what's happiness? Happiness is summer in Canada, combining my three favourite things, rugby, rodeo, and hanging out with my family. That'd be no, my, That's what happiness is. Sounds pretty good. I'll, I'll see you next. I'll see you next summer. <laughs> the door's open. <laughs> I, I want to be there when all these uh, players get off the bus for breakfast. I'll I'll help. I'll do the bacon. Yeah, it doesn't cause much stress in your house when you're trying to like feed thirty five people. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. Moff, brilliant to see you. Thank you so much. All the best for the new season. Cheers, H. Cheers, my man. You gotta love that guy. He has pretty much nailed it. Get out there, go and build some relationships, share some experiences and make some memories. Moff did it and he's doing bloody well. And it's nice to hear how happy he is with life and with himself. If you've enjoyed it, you can get us on Apple, Acast and Spotify. You can watch on Facebook and YouTube. If you did enjoy it, please leave us a review, tell your friends and make sure everybody else knows. In the meantime, my name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast and my happiness is egg-shaped. All the very, very best and I look forward to speaking to you all again soon.